you work at a shop in Copenhagen, yeah, called Viking. Okay, I would say perhaps the best uh, art supply in Copenhagen. Um, why do you think people should spend more in quality material than just buying cheap stuff? You know, usually when I have, uh, let's say, I call them guests, you know, uh, but yeah. you know they are they are customers. Yeah. But when I have people, I have a lot of different. Um, customers in the shop we have very very professional customers we have the middle range and we have the very fresh one you know the beginners and especially the beginners i i always uh, try to uh, to teach that it's much better to buy three pencils than 100 for the same price because it gives you a a, a, a lot better work you know the the quality of the of the pencil, if it's the pencil we are talking about now, it's a, you know it has a lot more love. You know the time, the material. It's like a, baking a cake. You know you can bake a cake in twenty minutes. You can go buy a bag. Everything it's included. You just have to add water. Yeah. It, it's a nice cake. But if you put your love in the cake and using the right materials you will have a completely different feeling. And it's the same with art materials. Yeah. And I think that especially, like, unless you're really a wizard and you really know your stuff well, you know, there is some people that just, they can use whatever, right? But we're talking about like a very little little percentage. Some people but... do their own paint as well. You know, they, they, they are like a really the nutty professor and, and they, they want to make their own acrylic paint, their own the egg tempera, you know, the gouache, the old fashioned gouache. Oil colors, they grind the pigment, add the lin oil, the fix the cicatrice, and, and so on and so on and so on. But it's a, it's a very, very few amount of people that are doing that. And you really have to know what you're dealing with. Because if you don't, you waste a hell of a lot of money. So yeah. I would recommend if you want to start to do painting, drawing, whatever, come see a... Um, a professional shop such as ours. If you are from another country, you go see a, a similar one in your country and then you should buy less at a higher quality. Does it make sense? So instead yeah, of being um, seduced of, uh, you know, the big warehouses, they have boxes with a lot of uh, um, pens inside you can you can buy 100 pens for for, for 50 danish krona it's uh, it's less than 10 bucks um, and in my shop if you want a very good pen you will pay 10 bucks for that pen but that's that's completely two different world and i always say if you know that your material is the best you know it's it's what it should do and the piece that you produce is not okay, then it's not the material, it's, it's yourself. You have to work with yourself to get on that level. You can't blame the material. If you buy that, you know, 100 brushes for 10 bucks and, and you are not satisfied with your, with your piece, you don't know if, if it's you or if it's, uh, I will tell you, it is the material 80% uh, of the time. And then you have to work with yourself as well. But it's so important to buy good stuff. Yeah, absolutely. You know what? Like I, when I talk to people over social media and stuff, often, for example, is a very common example. The paper makes a lot of difference, you know, that it can't get that smooth transition and stuff. And apart from technique, you know, you know how it is. If you work with something long enough, then you just look at it and you know what happened there, right? So you see it's like, okay, this is the way the paper dries and then maybe you want to invest. Yeah. And back home, back home in Italy, we say that the cheap always ends up costing you twice. It does. Exactly. You know, because you have to buy another one. So it's like, hmm. Yeah. Right? And also uh, the time that you spend learning the material, you know, if you buy the right stuff, you can be sure that if you buy it today and you buy it in 10 years, it's the same. You don't have to, to get to know your material at tenure because it is the same if you're dealing with the professional uh, uh, manufacturers such as, uh, you know, we have Lana from, uh, from France, you have Hanemule from, uh, 
from Germany, you have Ashes, it's also from France, Fabriano from your home country and, and so on and so on regarding paper. You can be sure if you are buying an, um, an Lana Aquarelle, which is uh, it's the high-end watercolor paper made of 100% cotton, it has been the same paper since 1590. It means this paper has been produced as it was Five here, 500 years ago, and it's still the same. The machinery is slightly different, but a lot of it is still hands-on. But the material, the cotton, the, um, the structure in the paper, you know, it's, it's mold-made and it doesn't have any um, fiber directions, which means it's uh, fucking awesome for watercolor painting and liquid acrylic. And if you like you, stay for a tattoo artist, you want to make very nice flash, flash and and, and things for your, uh, for your shop and so on. It's very important and very, you know, time, time is money as well, you know? So if you have to, to try uh, 1 million things out and you know, you have the, the, the cheap stuff and you not really know if it's working or not and your um, experience with it is, is just bad. So I, I would never recommend it and you cannot find it in, uh, in, in my shop. Yeah, just get the, the right tool for the job, huh? Yeah. Uh, before asking you something, I, I uh, Eugenia, uh, Eugenia just uh, connected. I wanted to say hi. Do you have anything specific that you were interested in, particularly? Uh, I think maybe lately I was curious about uh, brushes, you know, those calligraphic ones. I never okay. had uh, a chance to paint with those, and I'm pretty curious. I've seen a lot, and but never came to the practicing. And not only, you know, also just to paint on a paper, okay. like a rice paper, you know. Obviously the, the shape is very important <laughs> and there is a, a lot of different shapes for many types of calligraphy. And also for, you know, if you want to use um, calligraphy as the old Japanese slash Chinese style, a lot of them uses, uh, you know, water-based paint such as watercolor, or they thin the gouache, or you could uh, even use the, the very liquid acrylic paint. But um, shapes and forms are very different, and it's uh, completely up to um, to the artist or the user itself to choose what's uh, what's. You know, obviously, if you want to do a very pointy line, you, you shouldn't use a, a flat brush. That I hope it makes sense. Uh, but it's it's up to the to the artist that has to do the artwork to to decide what kind of, of form he or she wants from the brush. First of all, uh, secondly, it's it's the type of hair that's a big difference of the material that are used for, for brushes, especially in my uh, world uh, where we have, um, we, we're very focusing on, on high quality, uh, but we do have a uh, nylon hair, this, which has some good qualities, um, such as uh, the, the flexibility of the nylon. It's actually quite cool. The downside of nylon is that it's very smooth, so the paint will run off the brush very easily and very fast. So you can't, let's say you want to do um, a very, very long line. It's not possible with the nylon hair because it's too smooth and it would put the paint on the paper on a shorter period of, how do you say it? Not time, but uh, does it make uh, sense, Kenya? It will deliver right, right away instead of like exactly. keeping it for longer. Uh, natural hair, such as sable, for example. Sable have uh, more than one very, very good quality that we are look at when we, um, when we do calligraphy. It has uh, the point. There's no different of buying a, a size eight, for example. It's a medium size brush or a size zero regarding the, the point, you know, how thin a line you could do. You can actually make a very, very, very thin line with a very large Kolinsky sable brush. Um, and because of the, the natural hair, 
it holds the paint a lot better so you can really do your writing and you don't have to load your brush again and again and again when you do the, the natural hair, such as sable. Um, a newer thing in, uh, in writing and in, in round pointy brushes is actually the, the squirrel hair. Squirrel has been used for many years, but only in flat brushes because it has the same um, benefit as the, as the sable regarding holding the paint and the liquid. Uh, but in, in the past, they couldn't uh, tie it. So you could make a round and, 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 and good pointy brush. But now they have uh, actually found a solution for that. And the way they have done it is to stabilize it a little bit with some nylon hair. It's a special Toure hair made only in Japan. And I can't remember the percentages, but but we are down in you know one to three percent of this special nylon hair, and then you have the rest in in squirrel because squirrel and sable have the same benefits of holding the paint and the water. Because I had like a I, I was reading that they had this when you look at them on a microscope or something, they have these like interlocking fibers kind of thing. So yeah. they really hold. They right? like when, when you are fishing and the hook, it has the, you know, we call it, um, uh, yeah, we have a, a word for it in Danish and you probably won't know what it is, but we call it mul hair. So it's, it's like, yeah, what you say is that. It's like interlocking, yeah. 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 And it makes it hold a lot better on the paint when we are talking liquid paint. I'm not talking about very high viscosity paint right now, only liquid, but genius uh, question, uh, you know, calligraphy. Yeah, let me ask you, because I know that you, you are big into pinstriping and I remember you telling me about the festivals you do and all of that. Um, a curious, because obviously this is for everybody, but a lot of tattooers are listening. So um, they're always very curious about how to achieve good lines with the brush, because it's compared to fading and stuff it, it requires first of all more uh, manual dexterity right so more technique uh, and then the brush like you were saying if you have a good brush i have some mops even mm -hmm. that are very big but they 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 get very very pointy so you could technically even do lines with that but it takes a lot of control so then otherwise you have you know like you know riggers and stuff like that what what would you recommend you know, for people to actually use and practice to get lines? What kind of, let's say, tools and brushes and what would you recommend? When we do pinstriping, we use two different, basically, you know, we have the, the rigger thing, such as you just showed, and those we have with a pointy shape and also the long hair with a flat shape. And the long hair with the flat shape is really good for the writing the calligraphy because you can you can use the whole uh, length of the brush and you can make them massive if you want to write um, yeah, I don't know a name or whatever and you want it quite massive on a car or a motorbike or whatever then it's it's nice to have it flat but still long it's very important that it's long so you have the rigger and a pointy and a flat version and then you have the sable it's it's not the animal shape, it's it's like a sword, you know. Mm -hmm. It has very, very short handle, and the hair is very long, um, and it looks like, like an old Persian sword. Let me see and, if I can show let me see if I can show that while you while you talk. Um, and the reason why we are using those are for the straight lines. So if we have a car like a Cadillac that's five meters long it, it 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 it's very important that we could go from you know the beginning of the car to the end of the car in one line otherwise it it would look very very stupid and it's very difficult if you stop the line in the middle of the car and pick up the line again if you have to load the brush and if you have these um, um sword brushes you can actually load it once and you could do a line in, in five meter. They are awesome, but they are also very special. Show. It's a very, um, it's a very, um, 
And it's not for everybody. I would say the sword brush is only for people that want to do pinstripes. Uh, this is the hair and this is the handle. So let's say the hair is, for example, 10 centimeter long and the handle is uh, two. They, so they also come in different sizes. But then you actually draw a line with the whole uh, length of the brush. You're not only using half of it. You put the brush, the tip, and you put it down on the surface of the car, for example, and then you, you pull it. Yeah, that's very specific to pinstriping, uh, not something you would use with watercolor on, on a flash, right? No, oh, that, that is too, uh, too special for that. Um, let me ask you, what would you recommend uh, to take care of your brushes? Because obviously if you invest in good ones, I have some brushes that bought like 10 years ago, but I really treat them like relics. Right. So what would you recommend for proper storage and, and clean and to make them last a very long time and keep sharp and all of that? First of all, it depends on what kind of paint you're painting, you, you're using your brushes for. But let's um, assume it's, it's watercolor we are, we are discussing here. You, you obviously have to clean them very well. Uh, use, um, I always recommend two types of soap. You can buy the soap from the brush manufacturer for a lot of money. It works and it's it's really good, but you can have the same high, um, high uh, benefit for your brushes buying the, the baby, baby soap, you know, for the small baby ashes. It's also a very good soap for cleaning brushes and it costs um, a quarter of, of, of the, the, the brush soaps. That's very important. When you store okay. them, it's also very important that the, the hair can breathe. So when you buy a brush in a shop like ours, they usually come with a small plastic tube on the hair. That tube you should throw away when you get home with your brush. So you should never use that tube again. We have customers trying to uh, put them back on and everything like that. If it uh, succeeds you to put it back on, it's really, really bad for the brush because it can't breathe. So the air cannot get into the, the place where the, the brush is uh, bind. And that's very bad for the brush. So first of all, you have to let your brush breathe. You can do it by um, having them in a cup. That's perfectly fine. Always with the handle downwards and the hair upwards. It's very important that you don't put your brushes down with the hair downwards. It, it will ruin them. It's not good. Uh, if you have to do transportation with your brushes, let's say you have to you sit in your studio and you want to do something at your home or whatever, then buy a, a simple bamboo. Um, oh, what is the word in English? You know them, right, Steph? It's like... A, like those rolls. Yeah. Yeah, like, like those rolls. rolls. Because they are so... Um, like the stuff that you use to make sushi. Yeah, exactly. Because they are so coarse, so, so that can come a lot of air through and the, the brushes are protected and they can breathe. I always recommend when you have uh, used your brush for, um, let's say, three, four months and they are a little bit out of shape, then you should uh, use the, the, the gum arabic. It's, it's fantastic to get your brush back in the, in the good shape of, again. Gum arabic is, is it's really a... Kind of like this honey kind of viscosity, right? Yeah. And it's also very good to add to your watercolor if you want to improve the flow of the watercolor. This is an ingredient in a watercolor. So if you are producing watercolors, you know, our favorite factory is Schmingu. I love Schmingu. It's a family owned business from Germany. Still the same owner family. The company is from 1881. They do a watercolor called uh, Huadam. It's, it's, it's top notch. I, I, I believe it's, uh, it's the best watercolor paint in the world. If you are, um, look at a half paint from Schmingu, the Huadam range, it takes, 16 weeks to produce one little half inch and you can really feel it in the in the way that it works on the paper and the flow in the paint the, the amount of pigment the purity of the pigment it's it's you know they have 140 colors i would say 
120 of them are single pigmented colors, which is top notch. The last 20 is because you can't make an, you know, there are, there, there are very few colors you can't do without mixing pigments together. Some yep. greens, uh, you know, you can do green mm -hmm. without mixing, but there are some you can't do without mixing. But uh, you will always uh, go for the single pigmented color in every range of, uh, of, the, of the art world, you know, when we are talking paint, because it makes, first of all, a, a very nice uh, mix. So if you have your primary color and you want to do a secondary color, if the primary are not pure, this is a good example. You know, we have um, a chain here in Denmark called the, the Green Sisters. They sell acrylic paint and other kind of paint. And it's, um, it's a very nice shop, by the way. And it's very, very cheap. You cannot buy a yellow and a blue acrylic cheap tube of that quality and mix a green. It's impossible. It will always turn out brown or gray. And that's because uh, of course the quality, but also the, the pigment, it's too um, unpure. There's too much happening. But if you have a cobalt blue, a real one, which are very pure, and you have a um, vermilion red, a pure one, it would make a fantastic purple without any, uh, you know, any small, um, uh, I'm sorry for my English, but yeah, no worries. Um, so, so it's very important. And instead of buying 20 tubes, buy three. And if you have the money, then buy a black and a white as well. If not, just buy the primary yellow, primary red, and the primary blue, but buy it in a good quality because it will make you able to, to, to do the whole color charge. You know what? Like, uh... Obviously, then you, you, you find out your favorites and then, you know, experimenting. But especially at first, if you're starting to learn uh, about colors, like I yeah. see this when I, I give this the painting seminars about color theory and stuff. And uh, all that experimenting and, and understanding what does what in what proportion in which way by mixing to mm -hmm. obtain a color instead of having it. That's like invaluable learning experience because then you really know your colors yeah. instead of, right? Exactly. And that's um, special, especially for a beginners. It's too easy to go and, and buy, if you have the money, obviously, 50 tubes. I always recommend keep it simple and learn the process. Learn how to do the, your, um, your, your very nice uh, gray, for example. Uh, if you want a very, very nice brownish, uh, warm gray, you cannot do black and white. Black and white would do a horrible gray, you know? It's gray and you can use it, don't get me wrong, but, but you can do gray in, a, in a many different kinds of ways and you can do grays that's, that just, you know, it, it just hit you in the heart how beautiful it is. It's not just a gray, you know, but it's, it has this, you know, fan diagram and a little bit of ultramarine blue and alizarin crimson together with the titanium white and you, oh, it's, you want to eat it, you know, and, and you can yeah. really see it on the work, you know. Yeah, when you start mixing your grades with complementaries and you actually get all these beautiful semi-neutrals and stuff, yeah. and especially if you're using uh, paints, like you were talking about the, the more traditional watercolor or Lashminke one and stuff, they, they have a little bit of that granulating quality. Yeah. So you really, you see, mm -hmm. you see the emotions in that color. It's not just flat. Then sometimes some people look for the flat for certain things like I do sometimes. It depends what you're looking for, right? But otherwise you see this beautiful uh, quality. Like, like, you know, when, when you, if you would talk to a painter like yourself, you know, then he would, he or she would tell you that, you know, all the darks, all the grays, all the shadows, they're not black, they're not gray. You know, there is so many other colors in there. So that, and then you obtain with the quality stuff, otherwise it gets like muddy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and uh, the granulation, it's, it's a nice tool to, it's, it's not a tool, it's in the color, you know, and it's the pigment that determines if it's granulate or not. So if you have a color charge with 140 different colors, 
I would say 50% of them are granulating colors and some love it, some don't. They want that, that don't like them and want them more flat. If you want a particularly color, you should, uh, you should try the, the gouache paint and thin it, you know, buy a very high quality gouache paint and add that amount of water that needed so you can have the transparency as a, you know, as a watercolor. That would give you a more flat um, surface and, and color um, coloration. Because yeah. some like the granulation, some don't. Uh, yeah. But that's, you, you can't say I want that blue without granulation. It's not possible. It's the same as uh, the opacity in colors, you know. It's the pigment that determines what, um, translucent or opacity the, the, the color have um, and yeah. even water color that, that, that in, 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 in reality is all uh, transparent that's that's water color but but some of them are actually more opaque than others and uh, I remember um, my without any doubt favorite color it's Indian yellow I hated Indian yellow in the beginning because I didn't understand how to use it. I couldn't, um, I, I really hated that transparency and, and everything with the paint. But now that I have learned to use it and, and, and do it uh, how I want to do it, it, it's, it has become my, my number one favorite color. I love it. Uh, you know, Steph, I'm an, I'm an acrylic painter, but it works in the same way with, with, with watercolor. But in watercolor, it's more easy because you go for the transparent look, but as an acrylic paint, it's also fantastic, you know? Yeah, and it's a beautiful journey as well. You know? yeah. It's almost like me no getting to know a person. Yeah. Right? And one of the coolest stuff has come because you made uh, the biggest mistakes, you know? And then you find yeah. out, ah, oh, this is awesome. Another good thing I always try to, to tell um, people, you know, don't put yourself in boxes because honestly, there, there are actually no rules in the art material world. If I should put up one rule, then it's don't mix water and oil. But even that could, you know, the Kooning, the older painter from, from New York, it's long gone. He did something with oil and water and it looks fantastic. But if, if we should put up one rule, then it's don't mix water and oil. But other than that, there, there are no rules. Just give it a try, you know. And some of the, the best pieces I have made is because I tried and they, 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 they actually came up as a mistake. So that's... That's the, the mindset you should have when you are, um, I would say experienced, but also new in the game. Yeah. You know, like the, the mistake, what it is really is just the unknown, yeah. the unplanned. And sometimes the unplanned can actually be cool or, yeah. can, right? So. Exactly. And, and um, talking about what I call real quick, some people ask me uh, this question a few times. They ask me what type of varnish they could use on their watercolors. And I always said, I myself, I never used it because if you buy a good watercolor, I would like to ask you about that as well. Uh, because of course, light fastness is important because for example, if you have Ecoline, which are great to, to practice and they're cheap, but they fade if you put them in a place where the, the sun gets to them. I saw a painting with the pink is gone in a few months. Yeah. So it depends always why and what you buy for, right? But if you buy a good color that has a lot of pigment and is very light fast, then you don't need any varnish. But anyway, do you have anything to say about that? Yeah. Um, you know, varnish is often used because you want to change the look of the artwork. So I would say um, it's, it's, it's really rare to use varnish on watercolor, but it's actually not rare to use fixative. Uh, people often confuse fixative and varnish together, but it's two very different things. But the fixative... Uh, depending on the company producing it, but now we uh, talk about Schmincke again. Uh, they they have in all their fixed chip, they have the UV blocker inside and it takes up to 99% of the UV. Um, this this portion, uh, what do you... Of the percentage of the... Yeah, yeah. The um, 
if you want to change the look, some people actually want to do that, then it's very important to, to fix it first. So you seal the watercolor and then you could add your varnish. For example, if you want a very high gloss varnish on top of, of a watercolor, it's very unusual, but it happened. Sometimes people want it and it, it could look uh, quite awesome actually. Or you want a satin or very matte uh, look, then it's possible, but don't use the varnish on top of your watercolor without fix it first. Okay, and a fix you mean with a fixative? Yes. Okay, uh, let me ask you like a little nerdy thing. Uh, I use one of my favorite things, which is the thing I use the most in my, it's actually calligraphy ink from mm -hmm. Rohrer and Klingner. Yeah. And do they, which I like because it's more like flat and it has the kind of the same quality of watercolor, but it doesn't have the granulation and da da da. It is what is the same? Is it part of Schminke? Is no. it something like that? No, right? It's their own brand. But Schminke supported them in the beginning. And okay. on the, the very first bottles from Juan Klinger, you have the Owl. But they are two very different companies. And actually, Juan Klinger is uh, two guys younger than you and I. And all, right. all together, they are nerds, you know, on a very, very cool way. Um, and they are awesome. And Schmincke really, really like that. And they are giving them a lot of support regarding knowledge. And uh, also uh, they, 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 they hook up on, on Schmincke's uh, deals when they do purchase, because it is actually a very small company, Owen Klinger. I was uh, blown backwards when I met them, you know, because I thought Owen Klinger, I, I was aware that it wasn't Schmincke, but I thought it was a, a company at some size, but, but it is. Uh, they are filling it in the, in the living room, um, all this. It's <laughs> uh, awesome. Testing it uh, on the balcony, and yeah, they're fantastic. They're very cool guys, and they know what's so good. It's so good. I've been using it for like 10 years. So good. We talk about the calligraphy ink, uh, it's awesome. We just have the new sketch ink, fucking awesome as well. It's a border proof ink that are useful for fountain pen. Usually if you have ink, you know, like the, the old fashioned Indian ink or whatever, you, you should never put that in a fountain pen because it would block and ruin it. But now they have made a range of, I think it's about 10 colors. So you could put it in your fountain pen and do your sketching, drawing, whatever with a light, fast, waterproof ink. And that is really awesome. Uh, is the binder acrylic, yeah? Um, it's acrylic not, based. No, not on this one. It ain't. Okay. Um, what happened now? Can you still see me? Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, they they do um, acrylic based one. That's the that's the modern Indian ink. It's acrylic based. It, it's an uh, emulsion. The other one is on shellac. Shellac is is really no go on on many things including brushes. Uh, of course, it is for brushes as well, but you really have to be very aware of your cleaning. If the shellac is, is dry, it's uh, nearly impossible to get rid of. Okay. Um, let's switch a little bit to like the other type of material because I guess other people, especially for example, people that do realism and stuff like that, you know, perhaps they use more like color pencils and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you have a very good range of color pencils and you have some stuff that is like very top notch. Would you like to talk a little bit about that? Even like, you know, like briefly, like the main differences between uh, color pencils, because when I come to the shop, let's say, and I'm not too much into color pencils, then I, I see many of them and I'm like, hmm. And then some of them, they feel very dry, almost like chalk. Some of them are very fat. What's the a, what's a main difference between those categories kind of thing? Yeah, so first of all, there, there are many good brands uh, out there, uh, I must say, same as, uh, as watercolor and oil paint and so on. Uh, we have our favorite in the shop, um, and uh, if we're talking color pencils, we have been distributing Caran Dash for several years in Denmark. Uh, Caran Dash is also a family-owned business from Geneva in Switzerland. Um, Actually, it was a, a Russian guy that founded it back in the days. Karandash is from 
1916. So it's, it has passed the 100 year. Actually, Karandash is the, if there are some Russian looking later on, it, it means pencil in Russia. So Karandash is, um, is now, uh, it has always been a family owned business living in, um, in Geneva, Switzerland. And they have um, um, several ranges and they have a lot of uh, categories. They have the fine art, they have the fine writing and they have the office. But in the fine art, you see all the coloring pencils and they are in, in different categories as well because we have the oil-based and the water-based coloring pencil. And in these two categories, we also have different grades. Uh, the two most common one in both of them is in the oil based. It's the Pablo. Pablo is awesome. I love Pablo. Um, and then you have the luminance in the water based, water soluble. It's, um, it's super color and you have Loom, uh, museum and um, if we take the oil based one and you have to make a decision when you are buying a color pencil how do you want to use it because obviously a water based uh, color pencil can be used as a dry pencil but also as watercolor paint so you could uh, do your drawing you could um, take your brush and wipe it out and then you have a a watercolor um, paint. Um, it has um, a little bit of a downside if you want to use it dry. So I always recommend watercolor for watercolor. But if you want to do a dry painting or drawing, you should go for the oil base because those you could use layer on layer on layer on layer on layer on layer, on layer and really create a depth in your drawing which you can't do with, with a dry water-based pencil. It's impossible. You can't do the same thing. Uh, my favorite is Pablo. It's actually the cheapest of the two, but I really like the, the granulation on Pablo. I like the hardness on Pablo. I like it, uh, you know, the way it, 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 it works on the paper. Um, a lot of people like the luminance. Luminance was actually a challenge in the beginning because you had, um, you know, this business uh, that uh, conservate paintings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you had an, a very old Rembrandt sketch and you had... Like restore, like restore kind of thing? Restore, yeah. yeah. They needed a product that they could guarantee a minimum of 200 year that the paint would last. Nobody had it in the world. And Karanda said, we take up the channels, uh, the, the challenge. We, we will try to make this uh, happen. And they were um, working on it for nearly 10 years. And then 15 years ago, the luminance uh, hit the market. And it's, uh, it's also a fantastic uh, color pencil. It's, um, it's a lot softer than the Pablo, and it's a lot more uh, tight. It doesn't granulate at this and the, on the same way. I will show you next time I see you in the shop step if I hadn't yeah. done it before. I think I had. But it's, yeah, you show uh, me something, yeah. Yeah. And it's, um, it's a very, 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 very light fast pencil. So if you had an old uh, Rembrandt or whatever, you know, sketch or drawing, you can um, you can use those as a, a restorator wow. and, and, and 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 do it. We sell it you want to? to a lot. Of, I, I say, you know, you have to feel inside yourself. You like it, uh, not the hard way or the or the soft way, but you know, try try them in our shop. And I think it's the same at other shops. But we always allow our customers to try so they know what they are buying because it's very important. I can recommend what I like. I have a big, big love for Pablo. I really love it. And I tell people why I love it when I draw with it. But I have also a lot of people after trying Luminance, they say, I'm sorry, Michael, but I go for the Luminance because that's really my thing, you know? So 
that's the wonderful thing of being a human being. We, we are not the same. Yeah, you're going to try it. Yeah. Do you want to say that thing that you, once you told me a little story about why it's called Pablo and a specific color that was created? Something about like, a, who was it? Was it Picasso? There was a specific color there. No, that what uh, that wasn't the uh, the color pencils. That's another thing. It's the, it's the oil pastel from Cenillier. Oh yeah, the old pastels. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah not the color pencils. It's a uh, it's Cenillier. It's a French brand. Um, Carandas also have the oil pastels. Cenillier or uh, Carandas oil pastels is is the same level. It can't be any better. They are they are amazing. Um, but I love Cenillier because of the sizes. They have like big cigars, you know, they look Havana's um, and Carandas. They're slightly smaller and also cheaper, of course, because you're having a lot of less amount of paint than in the Cenillier. But Pablo Picasso has a need for something he could use on his painting that really want to stick on the canvas and put a lot of amount of, of, of oil pastel on it and nothing um, was available. So Senelier got in touch with Pablo Picasso and they invented the Senelier oil pastel together. And it, it is today what it was when they started. And if nobody have tried it, give it a try. It's fucking awesome. But just oil you lot. pastel is really amazing. You know, as I said before, I'm an acrylic painter but I really love to do my painting and then add the oil pastel on top, not on every painting, but on a lot of painting because they have this very soft and you can really massage it into the canvas and on the paint. It's fantastic. Should give it a try. Everybody should try it because they will fall in love. Awesome. That tells you a lot about the knowledge that went into actually crafting that product, right? Yeah. Damn. And um, what about something more towards like the illustration side, you know, like markers and microns? What, what's the thing that you would recommend for that? You know, there is a lot of different brands on the market. I would say 90% of them are more or less the same. Um, you know, we have the micron. It's Sakura from Japan. They, they, they make the Pigma version, the micron. We have... Um, Road Ring from Germany, we have Stetter from Germany, we have Montana, Germany also, we have Pilot from Japan. There's a lot of brands out there. Um, actually, they are, uh, the thing is, in the, in the old days, we have this uh, very special uh, needle tip drawing pens where you, where you draw it with the Indian ink. It the was, nib, right? Yeah, the needle nib. It yep. was uh, Rotring was the, the most uh, known brand. They have the Rapidograph and the Isograph. They were um, they were measuring if, if it says 0 0.18, the line was 0 0.18. So it wasn't 0 0.17 or 0 0.20. 0 0.18 was 0 0.18. So all engineers, architecture, before the computer, they do all the drawing in hand with this drawing instrument. It still exists today, but in a very, very um, compromised, um, very, uh, assorted. Like a niche. Yeah. But it, it's a, it's, it could be a gift and it could be really a hell, depending on who you are, because it takes a lot of time cleaning it if you're not cleaning it, it's ruined. And it's a very expensive drawing tool. It costs you from $50 and up. Wow. Then it's refillable, obviously. But if, it's, if, if it dries, it's ruined. You have to put it in the garbage, buy a new one. But they, they were a measuring proof. So if you, um, if you had to do a house in a certain scale, you could count on this line. But it was also, as I said, very difficult. And, um, you know, it takes a lot of time cleaning it and, and things like that. And that's why we have the Pigma microns today and all the other stuff. And they are also in a measuring, you know, you have the 0, 0 0.5 and, and so on. But they have never been the thickness that they are told they should. They, they, they are not 
fast. You you getting it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're not it, so. Precise. Yeah, because this is a fiber chip, and it's really um, if I press harder than you, my line would be thicker than yours. So even if it says zero point one, it's not zero point one. It's always thicker. So so that's why a lot of illustrators and and also writers they like to write with these uh, pens but but they are very cool for making illustrations especially because of the range of the thicknesses you have a broad one for the outline you have a very thin one so you can do your your shadow you know you do lines and then you have the shadows um, and they are also working very very well with copic for example alcohol based markers it's um it's a thing it it's in its itself, you know. And if we have to go back to the to the opening, buy the good stuff instead of buy the the cheap crap because it won't give you any um, nice uh, paint works, you know. So buy two Copic markers and spend the twenty dollar on that instead of buying a set with with one hundred and and have some cheap shit because it will make lines in your in your um, color layering, uh, Copic won't, you know, you can have it very smooth and everything like that. They are refillable, they're made in Japan. Japan, they know what they're dealing with when we're talking pens. Um, and the, the, the pigment liner is the right word for the microns. And, you know, we have all these brands, but, but in, in common, it, it would call a pigment liner. And they work very well with Copic. So if you do your 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 lines and you want to color on top, the Copic is transparent. So you will see your, your line underneath, but it won't blur. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Another very important thing is also the paper. If you want to do illustration and coloring it with, with Copic, you need a bleed proof paper. You can't use a, a normal drawing paper because it would go through the, the next four sheets. It would go in the paper, you know, it won't have a straight line. So you need bleed proof paper if you want to do coloring with, with alcohol based markers. We all know it from the school as well. We have these Sharpies, uh, pilot pens and so on. And we did a nice drawing in our little school book and uh, it went through to the next three or four pages. <laughs> and that's yeah. because a uh, normal paper, and it, it could be very good drawing paper, but it doesn't have the coating. So that's why you have to, to use the right paper for the right project and the, the right material. Yeah. Same as with awesome. watercolor. You shouldn't use a drawing paper with, with watercolor because the watercolor would make it bend a lot because it, it get wet. So that's why we should use a, a cotton-based, you know, mold made um, or, or use a cellulose made on the right way, contain the right amount of glue and and so on and so on. So that's that's important. Okay. And that's why people uh, see me or my colleague in the business worldwide. It's 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 you know, it's what you get if you go to the right places. You know, you can have a nice explanation instead of buying uh, five ch cheap pads different places, but they really don't know what to sell you when you ask for a specific thing. So. So come see a professional. It would make your life a lot easier. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of that. Um, I'm going to ask if Je uh, Eugenia has a, a question, and then I'm going to ask you just a few questions, and, and, uh, and I'll let you go. Uh, Eugenia, do you have any questions about something specific? Uh, I hope I didn't miss it, uh, but maybe I also was curious about acrylic inks. Mm -hmm. Any Acrylic conditions? for, uh, for uh, watercolor paper or rice paper, mm -hmm. you know, the pigments. Acrylic uh, ink is, um, is originally made for airbrushing. It's, uh, you know, mm -hmm. we have uh, acrylic paint as we know it today was invented by a company in the States called Liquitex. They invented acrylic paint in 1955, as we know acrylic paint today. And the reason why it, it was invented is because of 
all the the house painters they were dying from the very toxic uh, wall paint that they were using back in the days. That's why they try to invent a more healthy paint to paint houses with. Um, by a mistake, oh, you can't call it a mistake, but but actually then back in, in 1955, the acrylic paint as we know it today for art, you know, making art was invented. And later on, back in the um, 70s, early 80s, um, you had this uh, thing called airbrush. You know what airbrush is, Gina? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, a lot of illustrators before the computers could make incredible artworks with airbrush. A lot of the custom painters were using airbrush for the for the choppers and the cars and whatever. And they needed a, a paint that could go through this very, very, very thin nozzle on the airbrush. And if they tried to squeeze on a heavy body acrylic paint, as we know it back in the days, it wouldn't simply work. So um, as I heard it, Schmincke was the first one to invent acrylic colors as a liquid acrylic ink for airbrushes back in the, in the late 70s. It was the first liquid acrylic ink. And as I said, it was made for airbrush, but uh, a lot of artists uh, found out that this liquid acrylic ink made as an emulsion, you know, that's the way they did it was fantastic uh, for um, for ink for example acrylic uh, it was fun i use it a lot as a you know i i do um i throw it on my canvas and it explode and it makes some nice uh, things sometimes i wet my canvas before i paint it and on the wet surface if i if i just you know sip some acrylic ink on it it would make some very very awesome things on it and the same things you could do on paper as well. If you try to do a wet on wet painting with the acrylic inks, you will see some very nice magic happening. But this acrylic ink can be used for calligraphy. You can use it on rice paper. You can use it on watercolor paper. You can use it on, on, uh, on canvases. You can use it on cardboard. It could be used on wood. That's honestly not anything you can't use it on besides any oil surface it wouldn't it won't be adhesive on oil based surface you could use it on an oil painting when the oil painting is approximately 12 year, uh, 12 months old because then it's really dry through then it's okay to use um, acrylic ink on top of it but not before mm -hmm. uh, you have to be very careful regarding cleaning after using acrylic ink because it's not the same as as on watercolor it doesn't matter i won't recommend it but it, it doesn't matter if you forget to clean your brush after you do a watercolor painting mm -hmm. it can easily be cleaned out but you can't clean it out when it's dry with the acrylic ink mm -hmm. and if you buy good qualities such as uh, you have schminke obviously and you have golden it's it's an american brand you have liquid checks there are several brands out there they are, they are also very pure in the pigmentation, so you don't need a, a big battery of, of colors. You could actually mix with, uh, with very few colors. And as uh, Steph and I was talking about earlier, we have um, these two young guys from Germany. The brand name is Rohr and Klinger. They, they make a modern drawing ink. It's also acrylic ink. Mm -hmm. And it's a t generally more opaque, right? Sorry? Generally, I find it to be more opaque than watercolors, right? So it you had to keep that in mind. It's a lot more opaque, yeah. Yep. But, they, but there is different, you know, in the line, there could be difference within the colors. Some, some colors are um, transparent, mm -hmm. still more opaque than watercolor, and some are more opaque. But you can always see the information on the bottom. You have a square. Mm -hmm. on, on the ball and it doesn't matter what brand it is it's it's even a square or, or a circle if it's black it's opaque if it's white it's transparent mm -hmm. if it's white with a with a line mm -hmm. it's semi transparent 
if it's uh, white on uh, one half and black on the other half, it's semi-opaque. So mm -hmm. that's what that means. And then you have the, the stars. The stars are for the light fastness. So, so uh, more stars is equal to more uh, light fast. Mm -hmm. Awesome, wow. awesome. Thank you very much. You're so much information. I'm gonna just give you a couple more questions and then I'll set you free. Uh, a lot of people ask about masking fluid. Mm -hmm. And I tried, it, it sounds funny because it sounds like uh, Schmink is paying us, but it's not. It's just that you try and then it, that's what is best. I got some masking fluid from Schmink. Uh, I really like it because it's easy to, to, to apply and easy to remove. So some yeah. people have been complaining, oh, I put this masking fluid, then you rip off the paper, which I don't find it. Do you have any recommendation with it or how people should use it or just buy a good one and that's it? No, there are some rules uh, attached to it. Uh, also, yeah. uh, which means obviously buy a good one because then you are fifty percent of the way. But it's very important that that the paper is is geared up for the masking fluid. It's not all paper that 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 is. We make our own paper in Viking. We have a line called Viking Iris. It con contains fifty percent cotton, fifty percent cellulose. The way this particular piece of paper is, is glued and how the surface is, it's very open, the surface. It does it not compatible with the masking fluid. It won't work. So that's very important. First of all, you have to have a paper that are suitable for masking fluid. Second- like What a color paper, like 100% cotton, they work fine, right? Yeah, a lot of them work fine, um, but there is actually some that doesn't. It depend on the on the surface, so so that's not um that's not not a rule there. You have to to see the paper before you get. But 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 for example, if they are very um, mushroom ish, very fluffy, the paper you can feel it. Then it's usually very open, and the fluid would go in the paper and not stay on the paper, and that's the problem. So if it's in the paper and you wipe it off, it would take off the paper. That's uh, mistake number one. Uh, mistake number two is uh, you're leaving it on the paper for too long time. So actually masking fluid should be used as uh, following. You have your paper, you do your masking, you do your drying. A lot of people use hair dryers because it goes faster, but otherwise time will make it dry faster. Then you do your water coloring, then it's dry, and then you peel off the masking fluid. It shouldn't be on the surface for more than 48 hours. That's a no-go. So if people have had it for a week, it would tear off the paper. So you have a time uh, lap uh, for 48 hours when you have applied it and you have to remove it. All right. Very awesome. important. Yeah, because a lot of people ask about that. And um, another painter asked me, uh, what's the most stable and lasting surfaces, type of surfaces to oil paint on, apart from canvas? It could be many things. It's, it's the way you prep it. Uh, you could paint uh, on, on wood. You could have a, um, a board of wood. You could actually have a, a, a thick cardboard. If you use cardboard, you should... Um, be aware that that it would go like a bow, you know, the arrow and bow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you're not uh, paint on the backside as well, so it would stretch. It, and that's the fiber and the cardboard that are doing it. But you can, um, technically, you could uh, paint uh, oil colors on uh, every surface, more or less. But it's very mm -hmm. important uh, with, the, with the preparation. So if you have a... Um, you know, a wood plate, you should, um, you should grind it with, with, with gesso first. So they all attach better. And then you could do a lot of artwork uh, that way. Um, a lot of artists use that wood, you, but, but that's, that's not really any rules regarding that. Uh, it's very important that you, um, that you give, give it time for dry and you have to know the material the oil and make it all uh, go in, in a unit. Um, so if it takes 
depending on the layer, but let's say this it's it's surface dry within three weeks on a canvas. It could take longer time on wood and it could take less time on, on cardboard or fabric or whatever, but but fabric it's 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 actually the same as canvas. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, but the preparation is very important. All right. Also, if the, you know, we have three steps when we're talking uh, oil paint. You have the, the surface, the prep, you do your artwork, and then usually you do your varnish. It's very important that you, that you uh, let the oil dry very, very, very um, dry. You know, oil paint can take up to eight to 12 months because it's really dry. We're not talking about dry in the surface, but really dry. Um, so that's why you shouldn't put varnish before 12 months. You should wait 12 months before adding varnish on an oil paint. All right. Okay, one last question. And um, regarding uh, watercolor paper, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, was asked, I was being asked what the best tape would be, you know, when you actually seal it to leave the white edges and then you paint over. Uh, some people ask me about how you, you know, when you have the paper and you buy and it has the natural rip mm -hmm. kind of thing on the sides because, and if you would like to recreate that, right? I've seen people doing it by hands. It's just like a hand thing or there is some, some tool or something you could do. If you want the, the, the edges, I would say you should, uh, fold it and then you have this piece of bone you know the white bone we call it um, when you do the the falls uh, i don't know the the correct word sorry Steph. like the spine no it's uh, it looked like like a knife it's flat i kind of like the what you used to back in the days to open letters and stuff yeah 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 but it's made by bone and when you yeah. It's pointy in, in the days, back in the days, if you want to fold a piece of paper, you use this bone, the pointy thing, you press it up against the ruler, and then you make like a line in the paper and you mm. fold it very easily with this bone piece. Yeah. Just a second. And if you use that, you could use a knife and, and many things as well, but um then it's can you see it all right yeah 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 mm -hmm. because then you do the, the thing with the point you fold it and then you you open it with with the size of the bone then you have these uh, edges like the the traditional handmade watercolor paper yeah yeah yeah, yeah. okay you could buy scissors that's that doing but you can see it it made Spices, it's not it's nice. too precise. It's too precise. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Some people also have a ruler. They press the ruler against the the piece that they want to keep, and then they just yeah. You know, so that's many way of doing it. Uh, regarding the tape, it's very important to buy the correct tape because if you're buying a, a normal masking tape when you paint walls, it would tear off the the paper. Uh, so there is um, special masking tapes for papers, and you should use those. But the trick is, as with the, with the masking fluid, you shouldn't leave it too long, because then the, the, the glue gets very, very adhesive and permanent, and it would tear off the surface. Um, you can also, I always recommend the, the, the Flex Tape 3M, they, they have a blue not that um, white um, tape, but it's fantastic. It's very flexible. I use it for pinstripes and airbrushing as well, but it's awesome for, for the other thing because it can, it can sit on for, for months without doing any damage. All right, awesome. Man, you're like a walk in a cyclopedia of this stuff. <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, I have, yeah, been, uh, I have been in this business um, for many, many years. I don't want to come in on my story like that, but uh, I was a young, um, I would say I was, my, my mom, she wasn't proud of me. I, I was doing some, some bad things. And then instead of going to the right, I, I go to the left and why, 
because I go to the left, I find some very good people in my life. And that's the reason I ended up in this business. And that's 30 years ago. I've been in my business for 30 years. So I, I always say to people that, that are very nice to me as you are, Steph, and, and really say how good I am. I say, if, if I wasn't a, a little bit good, then I, was, uh, then I was too stupid because I have been here for 30 years. <laughs> 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 awesome but i love it you know i this is my business i it's my life and i love it and that's why i'm i'm really interested in in, in these things and there's always something new to discover it's like a never-ending journey yeah. it's so nice they, and they make a new thing and you're like oh, you become nerdy about it it's i love it and it's uh, very awesome to be on project that maybe be um, you know we have some very uh, very cool artists in in our shop selling paintings for a lot of lot of money and I, I i think it's cool that i have helped them participating that painting you know they ha- i i'm responsible sometimes for for why it's it's like that and that's yeah. a really um, it's better than drugs i think absolutely and when her majesty the queen comes and say hey michael can you help me with uh, with this uh, thing i need some special and and when I can help her, it's also wow! It's fantastic. We have uh, yeah. Not many people can say that, you know. Oh, I I actually get letters from the queen. She sent me two, you know. Thank thank you letters. It's awesome. <laughs> nice. We got them framed. Sorry. You got no, them framed. No, 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 no. I'm not. Uh, I'm not flashing them. I'm just. Yeah. So. Nice. Awesome, Michael. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jenya, for uh for joining, and um I'll see you in the shop. Hopefully, yeah, they, they, luckily they make you reopen soon so they can come and, you know, ask you more things. Monday we are opening. Genia, where are you from? Uh, I'm originally from Russia. Okay, cool. And it was, <laughs> yeah, pretty curious to see both of you. So but much information. It's true that you are like a walking encyclopedia. <laughs> oh, you're too kind. Thank you. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, guys. Have a lovely day. Same to you. And um, yeah, if somebody wants some some more thing, you just come see me in in the shop and yeah, ask whatever you want, and I will try to ask uh, answer as as good as I can. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you very much. Have you a good day, guys. See you. Bye, bye, Gina. Bye. 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 Have a bye. good evening.